Hello and welcome everyone to this week's MLS Matters hosted by CMLS. We really appreciate you joining us this Friday and being part of the community. And I would like to take a minute today and just celebrate. Happy Ocho Day. It is officially the, the, the official day of the launch of Clear Cooperation. If you haven't already launched a new market, it is today. Uh, and if you need any additional resources, you can go to the CMLS website where we do have our uh, implementation guide. Any last minute questions, concerns, or guidance there. So I'll just start by that. And um, we are recording today's session, so you can uh, share it back out afterwards. And also want to let you know all previous recordings are on there uh, on our website, of, as well as summary notes pages. And we are using Zoom, so you came in with, um, you, you're able to speak, but we'd ask you to be on mute and, so that we don't get too much background noise. And in using Zoom, CMLS has implemented all safety uh, protocols that have been recommended. So with that, uh, I am Danae Evans, the CEO of CMLS. And again, we're very uh, happy to have you with us today. So let's jump into today's topics and conversations and go ahead and meet our panelists. Um, Let's start uh, with, we have a couple of CMLS leadership with us today, as well as some representative with a representative from uh, NAR, National Association of Realtors. So if I could have each one of you go through and give a, just a brief introduction of yourself, your organization, and um, then we'll get into talking about today's topic. So Brad, would you please start us off? Sure. Um, so I'm Brad Belke. I'm uh, a CEO of utahrealestate.com. We are um, about a 17,000 member um, MLS member of MLS in the Utah Southern Idaho uh, region. Cover most of the state, about 97%. And I'm also the chair of CMLS for 2020. Um, and uh, I'll move that over to Mary Jo from there. Oh, hi everyone. I'm Mary Jo Cowan. I'm the CEO for Stellar MLS. And I just want you to know that that picture is a little bit old and I have not recently had a haircut. I have not <laughs> broken the rules and gone out. You can tell by looking at me on the screen, I'm in desperate need of one. <laughs> but that's a, that's a good picture. I don't know where you found it. But, um, and my, I, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. I'm also the uh, secretary treasurer for the uh, CMLS board. Thank you, Mary Jo. And Renee, which, if you'll make sure and show everyone your fancy new chair, holy oh, yeah. Nikes. Yeah. Look at that yeah. thing. I've got serious envy. One of those uh, fancy racing chairs. <laughs> good, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Renee Galicia, Director of MLS Engagement for NAR. Uh, I have the honor of being the uh, liaison between uh, the nation's uh, 600 plus uh, MLSs and their executives and staff uh, to NAR. And I work very closely with Danae and her, her team, uh, making sure that we're bringing in, bringing in the uh, feedback and uh, really you know, working closer together with the MLSs in the country, CMLS and uh, other industry partners. Great. Thank you, Renee. And I just want to build on that, make sure, um, mention that I think it was about three and a half, four years ago where CMLS and NAR did enter into an agreement or a partnership where we would work, I call it more purposely together on just helping to support and elevate the MLS industry and that our two organizations would just just collaborate better. And I think there's been a lot of positives from that. So I congratulate the CMLS leadership of being willing to do that and, and just what a great partnership it's been um, with Renee and the team over at NAR. So thank you for that. Brad, will you start a little bit of just giving the group today some background or just some uh, perspective on CMLS submitted this particular policy, but before we get into it, just, just tell, share a little bit of why has CMLS chosen to become more active in policy and um, what does that look like for you? And just share with our, our attendees and our members today what, what's, what's been the goal of CMLS with this. So I think, I mean, I think just as an organization, as you, as you grow up as an organization and your membership increases and your, your political influence can increase, uh, policy naturally is, is part of that. And I think uh, from the various leaders of CMLS uh, from the beginning until now, you've probably had individuals um, on the board of directors who have touched and helped shape every single MLS policy that has taken place in the past 20 years. Um, and I think with that collective base of knowledge and that collective influence, 
that we've had over the years and now our partnership with NAR, it has led us to a place where we can really as a group um, and as two collective associations really come together and, and make the industry better by, by, by talking to our members, finding out where their deficiencies are, where their Brad, I think you hit mute. Did, did he go quiet for anyone else? I, yeah, he's, I think he's muted. Brad, you're muted. Brad. The constant. Uh, Brad, now he's back. <laughs> Brad, we missed a small part of your brilliance that you were sharing. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. I just, just about the last 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, I don't know where I left off. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's okay, you were saying stuff that, that, that was awesome. So well, I, I, what I was saying is from, from uh, hopefully, I'm not repeating myself, from, from MLS of Choice to Ocho to what had come before it, um, you were trying to make MLSs better. And uh, did you hear the strengths and deficiencies part of my talk? That's right where you ended. All right. right. So we're going to get the strengths and deficiencies. So we have, we have MLSs that have great strengths, and we have MLSs that have weaknesses. And as a body, as, as CMLS and as NAR and other groups, we are trying to find the best and, and bring those strengths to everybody and find the deficiencies and help to cure them with policy and with, uh, with um, um, just education. And I think CMLS does a tremendous job of that. And like I said, our leaders from the past to our leaders who will go into the future, it'll just get better and better as we try to bring our industry forward. So I think uh, I, I apologize for my unstable internet connection. I went to my office today and now I'm upset. <laughs> I have the best internet connection I, I should have here and it, and it, and it paused on. But, but that, that's the background is that we're, we're constantly striving to get better. Um, excellence is an important part of my uh, time as chair here. And I want, I want everybody to get, always get better, right? You, you, you're never perfect, but you can get better every day. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, Mary Jo, could you speak to us a little bit? You've been involved with CMLS for quite some time, whether just a very active and passionate member, where you've been in leadership at different times. How do you see balancing, Brad talked about getting MLS is better and, and solving some of the issues, but where and how do we balance the needs and pain points of the brokerage community in helping to identify some of these policies, which is what a lot of this particular uh, policy is about that we're here to talk about today. Well, uh, you know, just to kind of piggyback on Brad, I think that the, the what's allowing us to be more uh, collaborative is the evolution of CMLS and the relationship that we've had. And, and I think also that that level of collaboration allows us to pull in uh, others to help us kind of shape that policy. And, and I would also say if it's, if not us and us, I mean CMLS, then you know, who else can pull together all of those different voices together, the voices of our, our brokers, the, the, you know, working with NAR, uh, working with other MLSs to find out, um, you know, what they need. So that I think we've, we've progressed to the point where we do have that voice and that level of uh, ability to contribute for, on all things. And I think that uh, listening closely to our brokers to their pain points and you know they vary obviously from brokerage to brokerage from size from market to market and along those things but what we hear from them and what we take away what we can do to help el eliminate or reduce or modernize you know any of the challenges that they're having uh, is is a key role and i think it's a relationship builder for all of us with our brokers and for us as the industry. So I think listening and hearing on a local level to what our brokers need, to the, the, the feedback that, that we get from the Realty Alliance and, and other groups or franchise groups or large brokers, small brokers, whatever they might be, we have to be listening. And if we're listening, uh, then we can you know, work towards a solution. So I, I think that's where the evolution has brought us. And I think you know, when we're talking about policy, the mm -hmm. participants are the heart of that, of the MLS policy. So we, we need to be aware of what they need. We can't always, uh, we, I would say some of us, or, or all of us may not be able to get behind every everything that a broker might suggest or want, but we can certainly look for those things that will help you know, industry-wide to relieve yeah. that. I love that. That's some great stuff. And um, 
I think um, I, I just want to make clear when we're saying us, and I keep hearing us say us and as CMLS, I just want to re be really clear that that means our members, right? Absolutely. Like that is made up of, of our membership and, and our MLSs, um, our, our business partners, like it, it's, it's that collective voice and we're, we're participating in our work groups and our um, section councils and just hearing all of those voices. So I just want to be clear, it's not just the CMLS staff or our board, but it is us. Oh, as our and I think that that's a, that's a key part, Danae, that, you know, I, I didn't really touch on. Okay. Enough, but I would say that we've been able to demonstrate this recent, just even recently with, you know, through the, the Ocho and, and everything else, but even right now with the COVID and all of the industry and the, the, the MLSs and hearing what the brokers want, all of that shows is a clear demonstration that CMLS can play that role, that we can collaborate with everyone, with our business, with the whole group that you mentioned with all of our members here, what they think here, what our brokers think here, what our vendors and third party, yeah. you know, so it you're right. The, you're, it is the class. So I just want to make that clear. Sometimes it is absolutely. just us. So, all right. Um, I did want to take just one second and just, and just talk where we've set that up. Why have we gotten more involved in policy? You can expect to see CMLS will be coming, uh, will continue to be involved in policy and bring it out. But the, the spirit of this particular one, and I want to just to set a little bit of the stage, we did propose in February to the Emerging Issues Group a, a policy that did say that um, a participant was, we wanted to ensure that a participant was entitled to receive their own data back. The data that they put into a multiple listing service, they would be entitled to get it back. Um, I did find myself this week reading the pain points from uh, 10 years, or I guess even longer than that, um, uh, some of the issues there. And so, I think overall it's in an attempt, it's in an effort to continue to solve broker pain points. What are those needs? And um, some of the feedback we've gotten so far is why do we even need to do this and who isn't doing this? To uh, we got some that said maybe this policy didn't go far enough and there should be more information in there uh, as to what should be required. And then, um, you know, there is some that said that this isn't needed or this, this they may not be in support of it. So there, there is all different um, feedback but we do believe that this is um, this does support a more vibrant and efficient marketplace. So that is where it came. And I have to tell you that um, one of the, <laughs> it has been uh, uh, not an uncommon reaction. And it was mine at first when I was getting uh, just more informed and details about it when I said, okay, well, what policy are we adjusting or modifying or editing? And I was told, no, there is no policy. Excuse me, what? There's no, no, there is no policy. There's nothing in writing that says this today. So um, several people that uh, were as surprised as I made me feel a little bit better. But um, so we did put this out there and um, we submitted to the merging issues in, um, I believe they met in March and then it came back. And so Kelly, if you would put on the screen, um, what is the existing language as of today um, that's going out there and um, Great, thank you very much. And so then, um, Renee, if you could just talk a little bit about um, what were some of the edits that came out of the emerging issues. This was not exactly what CMLS um, submitted. There's some some few edits, and I think Brad, you were on that committee as well. So if you have anything to add, but Renee, if you could just talk to us a little bit of, about what came out of there um, and sort of what uh, that process was, uh, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Danae. Uh, first, I'll start with, uh, I just want to briefly mention, uh, you know, because I get this question a lot uh, here at NAR, as I did back uh, when I was at the MLS uh, uh, at the compliance department, um, NAR staff does not come up with policy. And, and thank you for pointing out that this is a policy directive from uh, that originated as a recommendation from CMLS, uh, made it over to the uh, NAR's MLS Tech and Emerging Issues Advisory Board, which is comprised of broker members, MLS and association executives, then it moved over, uh, it's moving over to the committee on Monday, which is again, uh, about 120 plus uh, members and MLS and AE uh, executives. Um, and so that's how policy is made. Uh, you know, there's a recommend recommendation, a pain point or an issue is identified and it's brought forth uh, through the advisory board and it makes its way up. Uh, and just to clarify on that, Renee, and thank you for spelling that out. Sure. That, like, I don't know if I was just like, 
under a rock as well, but that there is no systematic way that NAR just identifies policy. You guys address policy that is presented to you from outside entities, correct? Uh, I, I would, or some... uh, so I would maybe have a differing view there. Uh, there, <laughs> there is a, a systematic, no surprise, right? Um, there's, we do have a process in place, right? And that's exactly what's laid out today, which is we have an advisory board, we have a committee structure, uh, and all that's designed to solicit and, and engage membership directly so that we're uh, making sure that we're responsive to the needs of membership. Uh, and when I talk about membership, uh, even at the NAR level, um, we're not just limiting that to, to the practitioners, you know, brokers and agents. We also, uh, we have over 600 MLSs affiliated with NAR. We consider them our members as well. Uh, and so that's what the advisory board and the committee structure is set up to do to solicit that feedback. Uh, we have multiple, multiple meetings throughout the year um, and, and, and not just in that realm, but we, all, we have a number of other advisory boards and committees uh, that, are, that make up the NAR structure. And that's precisely what they do is they identify uh, either market conditions or business issues or something that's impactful to everyone's business and, and where there is a need to promulgate national policy. In other words, where it's no longer just a local issue. And I think we saw that a great example of that is the clear cooperation policy where yeah. for a number of years, um, uh, as they came up to the advisory board, it, you know, the decision was made to leave it at the local level for handling. Uh, but once it became clear, once it was clear that it, this is now a national issue, uh, that's when the advisory board took up uh, and, and, and tackled the clear cooperation policy that we have today. Um, so that is, there is a process in place. Uh, there's feedback. We would encourage you, if you're a member uh, or an MLS, reach out to those representatives that are on the advisory board and on the committees. That's what they do is they represent you uh, they need your feedback. They need to understand what issues and pain points you have in, in the community. And that's how uh, national policy is, is discussed and made. Um, can, I, can, I, can I comment? Can I really quick on this? Because I, I just want to say, Renee, you have a, 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 a tough job. And I, I think that it's great that you're going through this <clears throat> detailed ex explanation on how it is. I don't know about for the rest of you, but for, for us, even sometimes here, we, we hear, well, the staff just sat down and wrote this one day and and threw it out on the table and and so hearing and clarifying that that you personally or you and you know Rodney and the rest of the team don't like sit there and go well maybe we should throw this out and see if it sticks that you're you're actually listening and hearing and but you're not writing the policy and, and I or, you know yourselves and throwing it out so you know you guys have a tough job and I just want to appreciate say that I certainly appreciate that and, and this process helps take that pressure off of people thinking that you guys are doing your own thing. So. Yeah, thank you for that, Mary Jo. I certainly appreciate it. And uh, I'll share that with Rodney as well. And, and you know, that's, that, that's reflected in what we do and that, you know, what, why I wanted to bring that up as well. Uh, moving over to the policy in front of us uh, here. So the discussion, uh, won't dive into the, the specific edits. I'll kind of maybe touch on some of the discussions that, that occurred at the advisory board. Uh, you know, the consensus was that you know, brokers who submit or, or participants who submit, uh, and I'll make that distinction, uh, participants who submit listing data uh, to the MLS uh, should be entitled to receive that data back. Uh, and the discussions were about setting that up, you know, from a policy perspective, um, certainly word choice matters. Um, and so some of the discussions that occurred were, uh, and you'll see there's a reference to designee ensuring that, uh, you know, wasn't a literal interpretation of that only the participant could receive the data feed as many of you know, uh, receiving a data feed from the MLS, while it sounds like an easy task, consuming that data, you know, understanding how to work with that information, uh, whether it's uh, through, the, through the, some of the RET feeds, RETS feeds that are still out there, the API, it's generally not something that uh, a participant can log into, put a username and password in, and know what to do with that or be able to work with that data. So it was important to have that designee to uh, ensure in the discussions were to ensure that whoever the participant chooses to hand off that data um, without limitation, uh, they would be able to, to consume that data and work with that. Um, discussions were also about what data should be provided back. Uh, you'll notice that in the policy, the text uh, talks about active uh, and off-market data. So again, just a, a desire to ensure that everything that was put in by the participant can be and should be given back to the participant, whether it's something that's in an on-market status or an off-market status. Um, and also there was a discussion about uh, charges and costs. So you'll see some uh, reference to the MLS's ability to um, uh, charge costs. It's not a mandate, 
Uh, I know many MLSs that already do this where they provide the broker's own data feedback to the broker uh, and, and some may do so at no cost uh, to the broker. There's certainly a cost to the MLS uh, and resources, staff uh, and, and the like, uh, compliance, management, security, all that good stuff. Uh, but certainly uh, where it makes sense for the MLS to have some costs to, to, uh, to the participant to deliver that data feed, you'll notice that reflected there as well. Um, the note at the end, again, that's to reinforce what I mentioned previously that there was a desire and understanding from uh, in particular the MLS executives on the advisory board that uh, it's truly that the participants data to receive that back and that there shouldn't be any uh, limitations uh, on how and, and where they distribute that data. Um, certainly, you know, there's the practical application of it where, you know, ensuring that the MLS can have visibility into who's accessing the data, in particular if it's a vendor involved, uh, but they wanted to make sure that there were no um, strings attached, if you will, to how the broker can use their own data. Great. Thank you, Renee. Um, and, and going back to when I said there's not a systematic to NAR's way, there's the staff isn't addressing how to go after the policy. Uh, sort of my intent with that is that we all can be involved in that policy making process. So I think you did a good example of if there's somebody seeing something that they'd like addressed, whether it goes through CMLS or they're taking it to you or Rodney, these committees, there, there is a system in which we can all be involved as part of helping to, to as Brad said, make it better. So I really appreciate you walking through that. And I hope I was not offensive at all in, in the way I presented that. And thank you for clarifying it. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so on that, um, I want to make sure and say if you guys want to submit any questions through there, um, through the chat, please do that. And I do have one in there um, and also wanted to let you guys uh, know that CMLS is working on some additional edits for this and we're hoping to have that finished up um, today. Um, one of the things we are going to be recommending is changing the word in here, um, broker back to participant through that. I think Renee, some of the feedback we were getting is, or you guys were getting is the confusion between broker and participant versus agent and just that consistent use. Um, and so we were recommending that. But one of the things on here is, um, and Brad, maybe you can even speak to this, um, but the previous uh, three years requirement is a problem because is it a rolling three years or is it three years and going forward? We tried this with IDX and it ended up making a change pushing the date back so data would not disappear. Um, and, and so Brad, um, our, uh, was there discussion about that in the um, advisory meeting? And also there, I believe there might be uh, an amendment coming to a change with that from another entity. CMLS is not recommending that. So I do serve on that advisory board um, as well. And I think the intent, uh, Renee, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the intent was it's a rolling three year period where you would always have access to at least three years of data um, as the broker or the broker's designee when you're applying to get that data from an MLS. Um, I don't think there was meant to be a stop gap anywhere in there. Renee, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, you know, certainly that's not uh, to say that an MLS couldn't choose to, assuming that, you know, th this is the policy that passed, there's no modifications, that an MLS couldn't choose to provide any and all data in the database or, or without limitation. I think the discussion was at least to fix the time to that. Um, so this would be, uh, at least from, from the text of it, the interpretation would be a rolling three years from, from application. Okay. And I think it's important to point out too, one of the, one of the issues that the advisor board faced was there are some MLSs in, in parts of the country that are, are charging brokers an exorbitant amount of money for a feed. And in essence, that, that, that cost makes the, the broker feed prohibitive. Um, so this, this, this policy is meant to address really two things is one to solve the problem. If, if an MLS is not providing that broker with their data back, this policy obviously uh, solves that. The second part is to make sure that um, through cost and price gouging that a broker is not prohibited from getting their data. Because you can be prohibited in two different ways. You could have a policy that says, yes, you can, you can get your data, but here's the cost of it and, and no, no broker is going to pay that amount. So I think it's important to note that this, the principle of this and the, um, the, real, the real reason why we're doing this is to ensure that brokers get their fair data back. Um, from the MLS that they support and put their money into. Um, so, go ahead, Mary Jo. 
Well, I was just noticing, I'm just kind of monitoring the chat and there was a, there was a question in there, which uh, I know that we've kind of discussed a little bit, but was, um, and maybe I don't, I don't know for sure if the group discussed this, but since the IDX feed has to go back to 2012, would that be for consistency's sake, something that might make this a little bit easier for MLS is to provide that data so it's not a rolling day by day kind of thing. So I, I, I thought that was a good comment. Sorry. I don't know if you guys talked about that or not at the at the meeting. Yeah. Well, Brad's muted again. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't I, I think the discussion was more what I said earlier, which was it was it was more of an understanding that there will be at least three years of history mm -hmm. provided. It could be 2012. It could an MLS could choose to give back all the data historically. Um, uh, that may be something, Renee, we may want to um, suggest having a, um, almost like an annotation for on how it can roll out. Um, definitely. And I believe there was another comment that soul data um, provides, that it provides soul data back to 2012 in IDX feed. So this is not about IDX feeds. Um, and I believe that is the amendment that's coming in. I have not seen it, um, it's not official yet. So to my i don't want to speak to that but i believe that's what i've been hearing so um, danae, danae i'm seeing i'm seeing some questions on there and saying not in a non-disclosure state we're we're in a non-disclosure state uh, this that has nothing to do with a broker feed right a broker a broker's feed according to what this is is not idx this is not necessarily for public display it has nothing to do with that this is the brokers getting their data back for their internal use or however they want to use it they still would have to comply um, in some markets with if they're going to if they're going to publish all of their uh, sold data online, they're going to have to comply with state laws and state rules on that as well. This doesn't necessarily trump the state uh, state laws. Great. Um, I'm trying to look to see was there other questions that we um, I saw Victor, you put something in about the photos and I haven't seen anything specifically on that yet. So I'm not going to um, have anyone speak to that yet? But um, if I hear anything else, I will definitely um, give give some feedback on that. But um, the other thing I wanted to touch on a little bit today before we go into our breakout rooms was, so we, we had, um, if, if there's other questions or anything, keep those coming in and I'll try to monitor those and see if we can bring those back to the group. And then you'll also have time to talk about those in your meetings. And then Renee, how long will that feedback form be open that they can still uh, comment and take those to the committee. Great question. So I, I'll, uh, I think I saw you included that link uh, in an email. I'll paste it in the group chat again. Uh, well, if it lets me, there it goes. Um, that form is uh, where we're collecting feedback on the policy uh, and we're looking to get that over to the committee members this weekend ahead of the Monday meeting. So if you can get your responses in today or tomorrow, uh, that would be great. Please feel free to share that feedback form with your membership. Uh, if you're an MLS executive or association executive or with fellow uh, brokers and agents, uh, if you're a member. Okay, so everyone saw that. Renee just put that in there. It's the link to um, a comment form. Those will be compiled and submitted to the, the committee members for review um, on Mondays for Monday's meeting. Um, and then I just want to clarify what the feed is because there's definitely, there's a lot coming through here between IDX and the data feed. And I think Chris Creo, you you put something in there of what the data was, and we've had some conversations. So, Mary Jo, um, or it, actually any one of you, just clarifying what the feed is that we're talking about. Sure, I can do that. I, I uh, just in general, the feed that we're talking about here is a feed of the broker, and when we talk about the participant, we're talking about the broker, the designated realtor, whatever term you might use that. Because I I saw another reference. We're not talking about agents being able to request this strictly a, a broker participant being able to say, hey, MLS, I want all of my, all of the listings that I have added into the MLS back to my, back to me for my use. It doesn't include any other broker's listings. It doesn't include, um, you know, any, it's just my, I'm broker, I'm the broker. I want my data back so that I can use it for whatever I want to use it for. And that's what I get back is what my, what I entered, what my or my staff entered into the system. 
on behalf of my brokerage. Great. Is that clear? Or Brad, anything to add to that, that that helps with that understanding? Yeah, and again, the, the, the focus here is the, the participant. I think Lori, uh, Lori's comment there kind of hits on that, right? That, uh, and maybe the need to distinguish between the broker verbiage and the participant. The intent is to allow for the participant, the uh, you know, the qualifying participant at the MLS who is responsible for the firm or the brokerage itself, not just anyone that has a broker's license to get the data. If this is for the, the qualifying participant uh, who, you know, brings in all the, the affiliated, uh, whether it's uh, uh, brokers or salesperson licensees, uh, this would only be for the participant themselves. And Zanay, I think what you're were, you were kind of hinting at is, um, other information that maybe the MLS provides to supplement a listing, um, this would not include that. So um, just a clear, quick example of that would be a latitude and longitude that maybe the MLS generates using their mapping provider. Um, that lat and long is owned by the MLS or owned by the mapping provider and is, would not be something that is the intellectual property or the uh, um, uh, would come through a feed like this. It wouldn't be part of the, the, the right of the participant to get that, what I would call supplemental data. Thank you for clarifying that. Coming from the finance world, I call it commingling of funds. <laughs> I don't know that it applies in the data world, but that's, that's what I keep going. That's a good it. way to look at it, though, because in a lot of cases, we as the MLS aren't licensed by our third parties to distribute that beyond the use inside the MLS. So we would be commingling in that case. <laughs> All right. I, I try not to use the word too much. It, <laughs> yeah. um, all right, so the next thing I wanted to just move to is, um, if, and again, if you have additional questions, please bring those in. I, I, like I said, I'm trying to monitor those. I think my panelists are doing a great job um, uh, of helping to watch those as well, so I appreciate that. Um, have them agree to appropriate usage. So we'll keep watching that. But what I wanted to touch on a few minutes is um, just get everyone thinking and sort of talking about um, this is, this is the policy that's coming uh, through for this May meeting, but then we also want to look at, okay, where is some opportunities that could happen in um, November? So what are some things we need to start thinking about or talking about come in November that would continue to um, elevate the industry, support brokers? Um, I'd like to call it foster innovation while still protecting the gold star standard of data that MLS has provide. So how do we balance those two? And so um, I would throw that question out to my panelists and, and I have Kelly's got on the screen here. Um, if you saw, we did just issue uh, yesterday um, based off one of our MLS matters webinars and thank you to both Craig Cheatham uh, um, Realty Alliance, actually we had several brokers, Bill Fowler and Caitlin and Remax contributed to this. Um, and also uh, Victor, I know you're on here, you helped us with these questions and putting it together, but a list of questions and pain points and just concerns that brokers were having today, how MLSs could support them in the current environment. And I was reading back through it, I've got it here. There's a lot of questions on there that MLSs could continue to ask even once we get somewhat back to our our, our, our new normal lives uh, as that rolls out, but what's some possible uh, national policies you think that we could consider we should start talking about? Photos was bubbling up, um, other things. Um, and I would say that conversation's balanced with what needs to stay local? What doesn't need a national policy? So I would throw that out to my panelists of what some ideas or questions and, and Feel free to tell me what you think about the guide. And I know my board members read the guide because I had you guys review it first. <laughs> Janae, I'm going to talk really fast because I'm, unfortunately I'm at home in the guard. The, uh, they're right outside my window chopping up things and mowing the lawn and making that. a lot of noise. So I'll, I, I don't want to talk too long. But one of the things that I think that we need to do is be looking you need to be listening and looking. I said this earlier, but there, you know, just like this policy proposal here, it was, it was, it's one of those, well, because it's not in there, I, it, I don't, there's no rule. So I think we have to be looking and listening to the brokers. What's not in the, the rules that will be, would be helpful to them so that there's no ambiguity so that it's clear. So, uh, and I, and I think if we continue to reach out through, through all of our, uh, everybody, like you had said, our whole our whole sphere, to get those ideas in ahead of time, it gives us the chance to reach out 
to others and get feedback and to package something up uh, that can go forward to the committee. So, you know, I don't have one at the top of, in the top of my mind that that we absolutely, you know, that's glaringly missing. But I think we need to, you know, say what 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 do you all think is missing, which is what you're doing, but then take advantage of this great collaboration tool within our members of CMLS and the other entities that we're working with. So, if, you know, if, if there is something that somebody wants to propose, you know, have them share that with us at CMLS, and then we can collaborate with that group or whoever it is to, to see, you know, what the possibilities are and formulate. So I think it's what's not said that might need the update versus, I mean, I know there are some older policies in there that probably need some attention. And I know we're working on the IDX and VAO stuff, but it's what's missing. What, what's not in there that helps clarify for us as MLS execs and what's, at, and based on what our brokers are looking for. Yeah. So that's, that's my feedback on that. Great comments. Um, to that point, one of the things when we were crafting this policy or writing it um, very specifically in there, making sure they're um, technology agnostic. So even looking back at policy is what you're saying, looking what was there and addressing it. And as we're writing new policies or cleaning up old policies, making sure that we're not attached to the technology that was from that era and referencing anything, but leaving it in that space that can uh, grow and innovate and not hamper us because it's something that is, that is in writing that says, okay, well, that doesn't facilitate something happening because it references an old technology. So um, I would ask Renee or Brad, do you guys have any thoughts or ideas? I think you're like busy answering all the chats. I love it. <laughs> um, uh, any thoughts or ideas on, on future policies or how to go about it? Um, I'll, I'll just add from, from my perspective, I, you know, we'll, from an NAR perspective, we'll support, you know, any direction, uh, any conversations. Uh, what I would just encourage, and I think I uh, stated this at, at my opening was, um, having these discussions at uh, not only locally, but at the advisory board level, we have various groups within NAR. Um, if you're not on a, on a committee or, or advisory board, uh, you know, send in a request to put something on the agenda for discussion. Uh, any and all discussion is good. Um, take, as Mary just stated, reviewing existing policies and, and you know, balance that with existing practices. Uh, and you, again, the goal of, of most of our, if not all the policies are to ensure uh, that we continue to promote the pro-competitive, pro-consumer aspects of the MLS uh, and making sure that everyone's working together for the benefit of the industry, for benefit of consumers and moving things forward. So um, we'd support any and all conversations. And I think that is, is where you know, a lot of these things are identified is just kicking things around and, and seeing, uh, identifying those pain points. Yeah, and I would, I would just add to that, that, you know, the advisory board is made up of, of a diverse group of people, MLS execs, small brokers, large brokers from across the country. And uh, I think the purpose of that, and NAR does a great job of it, is that to make sure there's adequate representation from the various uh, different parts of our industry so that the issues that bubble up, the issues that need to be solved um, can get in front of that group. And um, as CMLS, that's why we have our conference. That's why we have these Friday webinars. That's why we listen to what you put in the chat. We wanna hear from, from all of our members and from all of MLS execs that are out there about what is going on, what is affecting them, what problems do can we help you solve um, and how can we make things better? And I think that's what, that is the goal. And not everybody's gonna agree with every policy or every word of every policy. And I think we, we, uh, we wordsmith a lot and we do those things and that's just part of our nature. But, but in general, the purpose is good. And if the purpose is good and the purpose makes us better, um, that's what we're trying to do. Excellent. I love that. And then I'm just going to give one last um, opportunity here. If it makes sense, there still seems to be some questions and some, uh, some questions around what the designee can or can't do. And I think um, for that last sentence it, with the note, can we just address what was the intent of it? And, and as I understand it, there is already several MLSs that do this. They provide a feed back to the broker of their own data or to the broker's designee that they can do what they want. So it might be somebody else's handling. So I don't know if, if one of you can maybe speak to that because there's, there's definitely quite a few questions coming up 
mm -hmm. um, about that that I think maybe we could clear up a little more? I, you know, I, I would just add that, that you know, we, we do this and, and we, we always have, and we do have an agreement that the broker has to sign. He has to tell us who it's going to. It can be a third party. It could be their own in-house, you know, staff person or, or somebody that within the franchise that they are part. It doesn't matter necessarily as long as we know, you know, where to feed that data. But our philosophy is that that data once we give it back to that broker, that started with the broker. It's in the MLS, it's licensed to be used in the MLS by all of the participants and, and subscribers. But when we give that data back to that broker, that's there. So we don't put a lot of restrictions, but we don't put any restrictions on that. That's the broker's listing content. So we don't, we don't say you can't, you can feed it to this group, this group or that group, but you can't feed it or use it for this or that or the other. It's just the broker's data that they're getting. Now, if they're getting all of the MLS content, like a back office feed or a third party product or something, uh, you know, that they, they wanna, or if they, they wanna try to license the data to feed a national portal with everybody's data, no. We have agreements and rules about that, but what we're talking about here in my mind is at the simplest level for me, <laughs> is it's this brokerage is this participant's data. It was theirs when they put it in. And when we give it back to them, it's theirs. We don't try to regulate what they do with it. And Mary, let me, let me just answer a couple. I, I see there's some debate going on in the chat and I just wanna, I wanna be clear what I, I think, uh, Mary Jo, you, you captured it really nicely there, but I think it's just the, the essence of this is, it's whatever the broker enters in, the broker can get back. The broker can get it back themselves or they can have a designee, a vendor, a third party they're working with that gets it back for them. And then that designee or that broker can use that data for whatever purpose they want, um, as long as the broker gives permission to do that. So, that. so the broker obviously can use it. If they can consume the feed themselves, they can use that data for whatever purpose they want. If it is the broker's designee, that designee you would hope would have a licensing agreement with the broker that outlines what the broker is going to permit them to do with their data. Um, but beyond that, there's no restrictions at the MLS level. And, and I did see um, Arizona Paul had sent me over a copy of ARMLS's uh, current form. That's a legal document that says, hey, you're taking liability for this, understand this, and they have the broker sign that and fill that out. Um, I'm assuming, I think Mary Jo, you mentioned you have a form, so there's already some stuff. And I think, uh, Paul, you can confirm, I think you said that I could share that. Um, so confirm that before I post it. But um, so that form does exist and there are MLSs currently doing that. Can I, if I, if I can add, and only the chat scrolling a little faster for me now, but um, I, I wanted, <laughs> wanted to address uh, two quick things. Um, the note is, the note here, and a lot of great debate or discussion uh, within the chat, the note regarding the limitation or no limitation on brokers use of their data. This is specific to, to the data policy. Uh, it's not to say that this note exempts them from complying with any other MLS rules or code of ethics regulations or, you know, or, or code of ethics. Uh, so those are still in play. Um, I think the question that everyone's focusing in on is whether the broker to, can decide to take their own listing data and redistribute it to another party to create another product or something like that. Um, there's no, any policy that would prohibit that. Um, I haven't seen any MLS rules that would prohibit that. And really it's the broker's listing information, right? So um, it's something that they can uh, make use of today with, you know, they, they can use it for whatever they want as long as they comply with existing MLS rules and code of ethics. So there's that. Um, and then there was also some questions about whether this policy would require or prohibit uh, uh, licensing agreements. Um, this policy doesn't speak to that. Uh, it wasn't part of any of the discussion at the advisory board level. Uh, certainly, I, I, I know that many MLS is already, this is just putting it right back in your process, right? Many MLS is already have a established process to license and enter into licensing agreements for IDX, VOW, uh, and the like. And certainly, I think I saw a comment that uh, because they're a participant, they don't need any agreements. There's other things that are maybe need to be clarified or made clear as uh, uh, independent of the participation agreement. Um, such as security of the data feed, uh, ensuring no redistribution or, or, of, of credentials, right, uh, to an unidentified de designee, for example. So there's other things that the MLS would still want to consider that may lend themselves to a uh, licensing agreement. Uh, the whole goal of the policy is to ensure that whatever licensing agreements or 
any other rules that are promulgated to affect this or to adopt this locally don't run afoul of the purpose and intent of the advisory board, which is pretty clear on, on the policy itself. Okay, I think this is the busiest chat we've had of any MLS matters, so that's kind of exciting. <laughs> And awesome. I'm thinking the breakout rooms are going to be really fun today. Um, so I would encourage everyone to please stay. They, they have become actually my very favorite part of the week. Um, we have, uh, so, so I do want to remind, uh, thank you, Kelly, for advancing that we've got our resource page that's got all of the stuff that we've been producing, we've produced in the past, the COVID specifically, um, MLS Matters. So any help or support that you need, um, please go there. And then um, our forums, if you want to post comments and communicate and share with your colleagues, please log into your CMLS dashboard and do that. And then I would say at this point, we're getting close to pushing our magic button to go to our round tables. I encourage you to ask questions, interact, meet new people. That's my, that's the coolest thing that's been happening is people that I've not I've met before, but maybe aren't super um, vocal, have been engaging and talking and sharing and meeting new people. And it's just been the coolest thing. So um, please uh, make sure you're, you're asking. You don't have to talk about this. You can talk about anything that you want. Um, but with that, I'd ask Betsy to go ahead. I thank my panelists. You guys did a great job today. Thank you, thank you. audience for participating in the chat and being part of this conversation. And um, magic button, let's go to our breakout rooms and continue the conversation. Happy